Welcome to Spruce Grove Alliance Church, your home. So, uh, before we begin, I feel like I need to save face and I need to prove something to all of you. So, we're going to have an arm wrestling match and I'm going to ask my wife to come up and I'm going to prove for you once and for all that I can beat my wife at arm wrestling. So. Does that work? Yeah. If you weren't here last week, I did start yet last week with a self-depreciating story of when we were, I was in grade seven, and I let my wife <clears throat> beat me at an arm wrestling match in grade seven, something like that. Anyway, and uh, now I get her to marry me, so that, that all worked out all right. So anyway, here we are. Uh, t- today, before we get to the Christmas season, I know everyone is like excited. We even got snowflakes, fake snowflakes falling down here. Everyone's excited to get into the Christmas season. Our culture is trying to keep back in this thing called Christmas back into January, even before Remembrance Day. And, and, uh, and I'm typically one that doesn't like to touch Christmas until December. And I know some of you that's hard to hear, but, 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 but until we start back Easter up into February. I'm not going to start backing Christmas up into November because why we boast in the manger or the cross, right? Oh, touche. Okay, so uh, we'll get there. Don't worry. We get a whole month of celebrating the birth of Christ, and I have an amazing series planned. We're going to start into that next week, and then we get a kids program. We get, we get lots of stuff planned for, for the Christmas season. But before we get there, I just want to close off this Encounters with Jesus series. We've been immersing ourselves in these encounters that Jesus had with people, and we're seeing Jesus through the eyes of the people that that, that saw him in in the Gospels, and and in the process, we're we're starting to know Jesus. We're getting to know a little bit, a little more aspects of who Jesus is. It's part of our mission statement to know know Jesus. And so we're seeing with each one of these encounters that Jesus answers one of those really big questions about life. And we don't have time to even review all of them, but some of those questions were like, what's wrong with the world? Who can make it right? And what is my role in making things right? Today, I'd like us to consider this question, how will the world be made right again? And I pray that as we kind of ponder this, uh, that, that, and as we come around the communion table, that we would commune, come into union, we would encounter Jesus at this table. So a good start is important in anything you do. Our beloved Oilers know this. In a hockey game, you got to start well, or it's hard to claw yourself back from a, from a deficit of goals, Right? And then if you get behind in the season, it's hard to make the playoffs. But then if you do make the playoffs, you've got to start well in the playoffs. It's hard to win if you're down two or three games to none, right? We, we, we know this. I wish the Oilers would tell my beloved Leafs that. <laughs> hmm. A good start's important. If you're a musician and you are going to put on a concert, you, you usually start with one of your good songs, one of your upbeat best songs. If you're going to join one of those umpteen talent shows, idol shows, and you're going to audition for one of those things, and you're a musician, you, you want to start with your best song. Your good start's important. If you're, if you're a politician and you're going to launch a campaign, you want to get a pile of people in the room, get them excited, lots of balloons, lots of fanfare, and start with your best ideas, a good start is important. If you're trying to impress your potential future in-laws, it's hard to recover from a bad first impression, isn't it? Right? A good start is important. That's why we, at New Year's, we have a New Year's resolution and a sermon. I have three minutes, they say, to capture your attention or I lose you for the rest of the time. A good start is important. What we want to do is when we start, it has to be like a, a like fireworks show. You know how in a fireworks show they start with their biggest and their brightest blast at first, so everyone goes, ooh, ah, wow, and it captures your, your attention. A good start is important. That is why. That is why when we see the start of Jesus' ministry, 
it seems rather odd to us. Because at first glance, this doesn't seem like a good start. Turning water into wine? Really? It just seems rather odd to us. No major problem is fixed. It's done rather quietly, as we're going to see in the background, that at a private wedding where only a few people see it, it, it doesn't seem like one of his biggest displays of his glory, like nobody's healed. There, there, there's no major problem in the world that's fixed. It doesn't, as the infamous Michael Jackson used to sing, heal the world, make it a better place for you and for me and the entire human race. You can make a case for that for almost all of Jesus' other miracles, but not this one. Why did Jesus start here? I mean, he, he certainly finishes well with a big bright blast of the resurrection. That, that's a great way to finish, but, but he doesn't, in our minds, it seems really odd. Why does he start this way? If he's the light of the world, this seems really dim. Water into wine. Well, Being the son of God and being able to orchestrate everything in the universe, he obviously knows something that we don't. And perhaps he is doing something that we will see in retrospect and we will go, ooh, ah, wow, look what he did there. Let's let's look at this odd first display of Jesus' glory and then let's unpack on why maybe he started this way. It's in John chapter 2. On the third day, so just back up, remember the first in this series we talked about his encounter with Nathaniel, and he said, you're going to see greater things if you follow me. So it's three days after that encounter with Nathaniel, which just happens previous to this. So on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana. Nathaniel's from Cana, by the way, so you're going to see the display of my glory in your hometown. On the third day, a wedding play took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used for the Jews for ceremonial washing, each one holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them with, to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though his servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside. And he said, Everyone, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Remember that. You have saved the best till now. And what Jesus did in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This was the first of the signs through which Jesus revealed his glory. Interesting. If we're expecting the ooh and the ah of the fireworks of Jesus to display his glory, to turn on his godness for the first time, this seems like, if it's a fireworks show, it seems like a bit of a dud. (laughs) It doesn't seem very bright at all. Like, this obscure miracle in this little private wedding in Palestine somewhere where only just a few people saw it. It's the first of the signs. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we said that John is called the book of signs. At the end of the book of sign, uh, John, uh, Jesus says, or John says, there's many more signs that Jesus did, but they're record, they were not recorded in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and by believing you have might, might have life in his name. And there's seven signs done from John chapter 2 to John chapter 11. And so John chapter 1, we're introduced to this light, and this light increases incrementally like a dimmer switch, seven notches, and he starts really low, and he ends with raising Lazarus from the dead. And seven, as we know, is the number of completion or perfection. We see that in the book of Revelation, the other book that John wrote. 
And so this gives us a, a complete and perfect picture of somewhat what heaven is going to be like. But there's seven signs, a sign. We know what a sign is. It, it, it tells us, signals for us something to come and directs us in the way. Spruce Grove, five kilometers, right? Construction ahead on the Hende again, right? You've been there. Uh, or, or, or Edmonton, this lane, it, it, it directs us which way we're supposed to go. It signals something that is to come. And so this first miracle is a sign. It signals for us something to come. Yes, it, is, it, it meets an immediate need for the, for the people in the day, in the story, but it's also telling a larger story. This is what we call a parabolic miracle. It's a miracle that tells a story. Jesus did all kinds of miracles. Not all of them were parabolic miracles, but this one was a story that, yes, it met the immediate need of the people in this story, their frustration, but it also kind of shows us a larger frustration that Jesus is going to alleviate in the future. It gives us a sign for that. So what is that? I just want to note just a few things about this encounter that Mary and Jesus have before we jump into what this parabolic miracle is and what it means. Notice how Mary kind of nudges or, or, or assumes or implies Jesus to do something. They have no more wine. <clears throat> they, they have no more wine. <clears throat> <clears throat> just do what he says. I find it interesting that probably one of the few people, if not the only person that ever walked this earth that could maybe get Jesus to rethink his agenda was his mom. <laughs> There's a real list to this story. You can see it in the interaction. Mom, my time is not you come, right? You see that in this story. There's realness in this story. And, and Mary's like, mm, they have no more wine. <clears throat> She's implying, right? And, and so we see Jesus with 2020 vision looking back at his full life and all of his miracles and we go, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus could probably do that. But who else does? At Christmas time, we sing this song, or you heard it on the radio, Mary, Did You Know? Have you heard that song? Mary, Did You Know? It's a good song where we get to reflect, did you know as you were holding this baby boy that he was going to walk on water, heal the blind, and one day be, you know, die and be savior of all? It's a good song where we get us to reflect on, on, on the gospel. What well, makes us ask the question, did Mary know? Now, in the, book of Revel, or in the book of John, there's not just seven signs. There's actually a whole bunch of series of sevens the number of completion and perfection. There's seven I am statements, which is worth studying someday. The bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection of life. We talked about that in, in Lazarus' story. The way, the truth, and life, and the true vine. Number seven is completion. So it shows us the complete and perfect work that Jesus came for us to do. Does Mary know this? Does Mary know this? We don't know. We, we, we see in the book of Luke that we think Luke actually interviewed Mary because it says Mary pondered these things in her heart. Like mothers are able to do, they're able to ponder these deep things about their kids. And she had some information from the angel too, so she maybe has a little bit more knowledge. We don't know what Mary knows, but we do know that Mary knows a little bit more than most. And she's putting together pieces of the puzzle about who her son really is. And Jesus' response to her is this, my hour has not yet come, which is not some term that we would ever use. Is this, this isn't the only time in the book of John we see this term hour. You ready to see something really cool? Not only is there seven signs, not only is there seven I am statements, but seven times in the book of John we see a reference to this hour. Jesus would do a miracle and it says, my hour has not yet come. His hour has not yet come. His hour has not yet come. The hour has come for the Son. Then all of a sudden in chapter 12, when he's going to go to the cross, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And this is, and Jesus tells his disciples, this is the reason I've come to this hour. Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart this world. And then he's praying, Father, the hour has come to glorify your Son. So the hour in John and in the book of Revelation is this period of suffering and difficulty in the future. It's not a literal, actual hour, but it's just this time of suffering and difficulty. 
And so Jesus is linking this miracle with the cross. Why? I don't think the Romans or the Jewish leaders would care with a little bit of extra wine made at this little obscure wedding. Why is Jesus linking this little dud of a miracle to the cross? Well, the light of the world is what we sing at Christmas. It's a theme that we see in John chapter 1. But hear me out. Christmas is not technically the light of the world come into the darkness yet. All of the Christmas story that we're going to celebrate here in a little bit, the shepherds, the wise men, the angels, the no room at the end, all that pageantry stuff that we put on stage, it's good, it's good. But it is not necessarily Jesus turning his godness on yet. This is the time where he turns on his godness. This is where he shows his divinity, Okay. So you could say that everything, all the Christmas story that we know and we love and we celebrate, sing about, it's in the malls everywhere, is prelude to the light. Or you could say that it's, it's building the campfire with the, the kindling and the paper and, and the wood and getting ready to, to, to strike the match or, or, or light the flame. And this miracle here lights the flame, turns on the light of his glory, right? And we know from the Gospel of John from the episode where he raises Lazarus from the dead, that Jesus says the light does two things. It evokes two responses in people. People will be drawn to it, and they accept that light and life into their life, and accept who Jesus is, or they're going to be spitting mad, and they're going to want to extinguish it. And that is why Jesus links this miracle with the cross, because he knows that as soon as he starts turning on his godness, as soon as he starts showing the light of his glory, it's going to elicit response that's going to kind of rocket propel him to the cross. So, why start here? Why turn on the light of his glory here at a marriage supper? Remember, this is what's called a parabolic miracle. Perhaps he was doing a story here, telling us of something, giving us a sign of something to come in the future. Now, is there a grander story? Is there a larger future story that Jesus is kind of reenacting here? Is there another place in the Bible where we see a bride, a groom, and a marriage supper? Yes, there is. In fact, it is a theme that's trickled all throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, God is called the bride, Israel, or the bridegroom. Israel is the bride and it's going to culminate in this big banquet at the end. In the New Testament, later even on in John, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. And his people, us, are his bride. And then it's going to crescendo one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. Wow. Wow. It's a metaphor that's all throughout the Bible. And here's how Jewish marriages and weddings worked. Maybe a little bit different than in our culture. They would start, and if you know the Christmas story, this is very familiar. Mary and Joseph were betrothed. It says a little bit more than engaged. There's this betrothal that happened. A man and a wife came together, had this small little ceremony just with their family. And from that point on, they were legally married. They had, if they wanted to get divorced, they had to have a certificate of divorce. They were legally married. Then the man would go and prepare his house, a place for them to live, and build onto his father's house. And the woman would go and prepare herself. Okay? And then about a year later, approximately a year later, they'd have a wedding day set. And it would be at night. And they would come. And the bride, uh, the best man would scream, which is John the Baptist. He would scream, here comes the bridegroom. Okay? And then the bridesmaids, they were supposed to have ready, and their job was one job alone, was to produce light. Light was very valuable in those days. There's not electricity like this. Palestine at night is really dark, so light's very valuable, and they had to take, produce these light on these torches, and when the, they heard the best man scream, the bridegroom's coming, they would march this big light show, great spectacle of light, to go get their groom, get the groom, take him to his bride, he would take the bride back to his father's house. Now, 
if this sounds extremely eerily familiar, deja vu, it's because Jesus, when he would teach, his language is drenched in this betrothal language. We are in that betrothal period time where we are already but not yet married. Right? We're already married. We have this covenant with him, but we're not living together. We're not experiencing all the full effects of that, that marriage. We're not living together. So Jesus talked about this in John chapter 14 later on. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself that where I am there you might be also. That's thick with betrothal wedding Jewish marriage language. Okay? And so the wedding day came, it happened at night, and there was this beautiful display of light, and then they would have this wedding ceremony. And ceremonies in those days, it's hard for us to grasp this, but this was a top-of-the-world celebration rivaled by nothing else in their culture. It was the, like the, the best party ever in town, okay? I don't know if you remember this in 1993. I'm a baseball fan. This was 1992, the Blue Jays won the World Series, and this was the most epic thing in Canadian baseball history. In the bottom of the ninth, they were losing Joe Carter. It's a home run and wins the World Series. They were on top of the world for two years, and I, as a baseball fan, was on top of the world. It was a celebration. We were on top of the world. The Jewish weddings were a top-of-the-world celebration rivaled by nothing else in their culture. But it was also a celebration that was a connection with a larger story outside of the world. I'll give you a guess on how many days this wedding celebration lasted. You got it. Seven days. Interesting. And it had its connections with a seven-day creation where God started something new in seven days. And so this was the start of something new. And so it was celebrated over seven days. You want to get even to the matrix even more, even cooler? What day did Jesus do this? The third day? After he tells Nathaniel, you're going to see the light of my glory, the greater things of my glory. Okay? Three, in the book of Revelation and in John, In series of three, it's also a number of completion and perfection. I don't have time to explain that, but just trust me on that one. So Jesus is on the cross at what hour of the day? The third hour of the day? When he dies, how many hours of darkness cover the earth? Three. But most importantly, how many days is Jesus in the grave? On the third day, he rises again. The start of something amazingly awesome new. Isn't that cool? And so what better place? What better place to light the flame of his glory, to start, to turn on his godness, than at this wedding? Because it bookends Jesus work for us. He starts his work for us at a wedding, and he ends his work for us at a wedding, which is going to be the start of something amazingly awesome and new. But what is Jesus saying about this final wedding feast and party? It's a parabolic message. What is he saying through this whole story? Yes, it meets the needs of the people in the story, And helps them out. But what is he telling us? Now one of the things I didn't say about that wedding celebration. Was that it was the groom's job. Because we see this in the story. That the groom's job to to provide the party. In our culture it's the uh, the bride's family. Uh, I pity you if you have more than three girls. (laughs) You get get a lot of expense coming your way. I only got one, praise the Lord. (laughs) But, But in those days it was the groom's job. And the groom's job had to throw a party. And that's why the wedding supper of the lamb is called wedding supper of the lamb. It's his job to throw an amazing party. Okay. And wine was the single most important element in this feast in those days. And to run out of wine for this husband, this future husband, it would have been extremely shameful and embarrassing and shown his complete incompetence as a husband. 
Now, I know that sounds like an overstatement in our Western individualistic mind, but it wasn't for this honor and shame culture. Now, let me see if I can help us in one minute here understand an honor and shame culture. Most of the audience, all the audience of the Bible is an honor and shame culture. Most of the world is an honor and shame culture. We're an individualistic, me, my, I I think about my life, an individual from everyone else. Let me see, see if I can help us understand this. This would have been extremely shameful and brought shame to the community if this husband ran out of wine at this major celebration because that's his one job to do, showing his complete incompetence. So I listened to a missionary once try to explain this honor and shame culture to us in an individualistic culture. And he, he, did, he, he served as a missionary for about 40 years, and this was helpful for, us, for, for, for me to understand. He showed us this picture on a screen. And it was a picture of somebody that was smiling and it looked like they're happy. And around them was about 15 different people that were, looked upset and indifferent. They were looking at this guy that was happy and some of them were looking away. And he said that if you show this picture to someone in an individualistic Western culture like ours and you ask this question, this isn't a trick question, is that person in the middle happy? Almost every single person in an individualistic Western culture will say yes. If it's not a trick question, it looks like he's able to find some happiness in amidst all the sadness of the world. Good for him. Way to go, individual. Yet if you ask that exact same question to someone in an honor and shame culture, someone looks happy and everyone around him is sad, is that person happy? They say, no, absolutely not. I just blew our mind, right? Because their happiness is connected to the culture around and, and, and it's connected to somehow community. So somehow this guy must be putting on a show. He's done something that's brought shame to the whole community. And so there's no way that this husband could be happy in this story. He would have brought an enormous amount of shame to himself and others. By running out of wine, he can't throw a party. And so Jesus is saying, as the groom in charge of the final marriage supper of the Lamb, that I am fully competent, and there will be no embarrassment for me on that day. And the message of this parabolic miracle is that Jesus is saving an abundance of his best for last. These massive containers of water, which would have equaled about 680 liters of, of, of the best wine. And he, remember, the, 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 the master of ceremonies takes this to the husband or the, the groom because he's in charge. He said, most people bring out the, the, the good stuff first and save the poor stuff for later, but you've saved it till the end. Jesus is saving an abundance of his best for us for last, for that wedding supper of the Lamb. The Lord of the Rings is this really good TV documentary, trilogy or whatever you call it. There's this, there's this, uh, there, there's often there's these little theological nuggets that you can take from, from the Lord of the Rings. And right at the Lord, end of the Lord of the Rings, where an evil, the ring has been destroyed, and they kind of take a sigh of relief, and Sam sees Gandalf. You remember this? There's this interesting theological nugget that Tolkien throws in there. Sam says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. And listen to this question. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? Is everything sad going to come untrue? This miracle may not heal the world and make it a better place, but it sure points to that glorious day. In fact, the whole Bible says that's essentially what Jesus is going to do in the end. Isaiah prophesies about that glorious day when everything sad will become untrue. And listen to what he says. On the, this mountain, meaning Mount Zion, where Jesus is going to return, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best meats and the finest wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all the faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. It's going to be a time where he makes everything sad come become untrue again. It's this metaphor of this, this marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember a few weeks ago we, we talked about standing on that holy mountain, Mount Zion? And for some reason, Zechariah 14 and Revelation 14 tell us that that's a significant place in the return of Christ. And I, and I just wondered if, if we're going to spend the first 500 years of eternity just standing on that mountain, just taking in the abundance of God's best that he saved for last for us and the rewards that he has for us. And I, and I wondered, because in Revelation chapter 4, it gives us this picture of God on the throne, and we can't even look at God. It's kind of like driving at sunset, and you, you have to look that way, but you don't want to look that way. And so John stops describing all these flashes of lightning from the throne, and he starts describing everything around the throne. So we kind of get what God is like by everything that's can, able to look at the glory of God. Remember this? And in Revelation 4 there's these four angels, it says, that are perpetually looking at the glory of God. It says they're covered with eyes from head to toe, even under their wings. I mean, there's just wings, there's eyes everywhere, which means they are just trying to take in the glory of God. And it says that, that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, they cannot stop saying as they're looking at the glory of God, and we can't look at it where we die, they're looking at the glory of God, and they're perpetually saying, holy, 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 which means set apart, something beyond what I've ever experienced it before. This is set apart. This is set apart. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Well, it looks like we're going to have box seats with the best food and beverage. <laughs> and I wonder if we're going to grab that wine that he has prepared for us, saving the best for us as we look out over the new heavens and the new earth, and, and we're like, holy, holy, this is, this is set apart, holy, holy. Holy. And if we won't be able to move for the first half century of eternity because we're taking in the glory of what he's prepared for us. Do you know what your emotional response is going to be on that day? Where Jesus is saving an abundance of his best for those who follow him for last? It's interesting that Revelation 18 and 19 help us consider this. In Revelation 18 and 19, right before Jesus appears and comes in all of his glory, we call it a, wed a funeral and a wedding. There's three eulogies given. There's three hallelujahs given. There's three eulogies given for Babylon, which represents the world system and the enemies of God. There's a funeral and three eulogies given. And then there's three hallelujahs given for the, for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And when we read this, we're meant to say, to see which, which emotional outburst can we identify with? Which does the coming of Jesus evoke in us? Does the coming of Jesus seem to you like a dreaded funeral? Or does the coming of Jesus, when he's going to come in a blaze of glory and have his best for last for us, does it seem like this long-anticipated wedding? I've done a number of funerals over my 20 years of being a pastor, and one of the things I've learned with eulogies is that people, if they have an emotional, the audience, if they have an emotional attachment to the deceased or the family, they will tolerate extremely poor public speaking in eulogies and long drawn out memories. They will. It's just, and that's, that's just a fact. That's not, that's not a knock. That's just it. You don't have to capture people's attention in the first three minutes. They're locked on. They're not checking their phone, running for potty breaks. They're, they're dialed in. They have an emotional attachment. And they can, you can go on for a long time talking about the memories. And, and we see in these eulogies, this horrendously long eulogy 
about this person weeping because they mourn, because they've lost all the things of this world, the gold, the silver, the stones, the pearls, the fine linen, the purple, the silk, the scarlet. (sighs) And if you have an emotional attachment to all this list of stuff, you're going to be locked in and dialed on. Does, Does the coming of Jesus seem like you're giving up something? You're losing your life? Is it seem like a dreaded funeral? Are you going to identify with that? Oh, my truck, my stuff, my house, what I've done in my, my, my career, my life. I have to give that up. Does it feel like you're giving up something? Or does it feel like this long-anticipated wedding and the third hallelujah in Revelation 18? Then I heard the sound of the great multitude, the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Does the coming of Jesus, does that evoke something in you? About this long anticipated wedding. Many years after I let my wife beat me at an arm wrestling match. (laughs) We'll go with that. I asked her to marry me. We were engaged. That's an... Totally different story, I'll tell another day, but in, in the summer, and then we went to Bible school, and then we were going to get married the next summer. That was a long engagement, don't do that. That was a long engagement when you're excited for something to come, and, and so partway through is February, Valentine's Day, and so I decided I was going to do something, what I thought was romantic back, you know, like 23 years ago. And so I bought her this glass jar. And then I've counted out many days there was from Valentine's Day to the day we were going to get married on July 8th. And I bought a whole bunch of Smarties, and I put that many Smarties in the jar, and so she had to eat one Smartie a day until the day. Isn't that romantic? (laughs) Yes, it is, right? As anticipation for that sweet day, right? And what do you expect from a guy that can't win an arm wrestling match, right? (laughs) Anyway. Does the coming of Jesus and the wedding supper feel like you're going to lose everything or it's like you're going to gain everything? Is this dreaded funeral or is this long anticipated wedding? Jesus is saving an abundance of his best for last. The cup. You know, the cup in scripture can be a a good thing or a bad thing. The cup is in uh, Psalm 23. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy and all that follow me all the days of my life. And that cup overflows. But, it, but it's all, it also can be a bad thing. I mean, the night before Jesus went to the cross, what did Jesus say to his father? Take this, take this cup from me. He told his disciples, can you drink from the cup that I'm going to drink? <laughs> it can be a bad thing. And so here Jesus is, and and I wonder how Jesus viewed this cup of wine at the wedding after this miracle. He fills the cups of the guests with the best wine, pointing to that ultimate wedding of the Supper of the Lamb where our cup is going to overflow with the best that he has for us. And I wonder how Jesus viewed the cup of wine after this. Because there's another cup that Jesus was going to have to drink from before that glorious day, right? The cup that he asked the Father to take from him before the hour. (laughs) It's the cup that we remember at the communion table, which is a blessing for us, but was a curse for us because Jesus took all of our sin, bore it on him on the cross so that we could have the cup of blessing. I mean, make no mistake, there's nothing about the cross event that excited Jesus Rather, what it would accomplish, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorned in its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He didn't long for this. I don't know if you've ever been to a joyful party and maybe you've felt somewhat aloof and not there because your mind is on something else. Has that ever happened? And maybe you've stared off into space and someone's like, Earth to Brent, Earth to Brent. Oh, sorry. I don't think it's beyond the scope of Scripture that after this miracle, at the last few days of this wedding feast, that, that Jesus might not fully be present mentally. That his, 
that his laugh was maybe a little bit more forced. His smile wasn't full there. He just wasn't fully there. As he looked around at the people celebrating and I love how Timothy Keller says it. Jesus sat amidst all the joy of the wedding feast, sipping the coming sorrow, so that you and I who believe in him can sit amongst the world's sorrow, sipping the coming joy. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Spruce Grove Alliance Church. For more information or to hear past messages, please visit sgac.net.